The War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells. Book 1 The Coming of the Martians. Chapter 8. Friday Night. The most extraordinary thing to my mind, of all the strange and beautiful things that happened that Friday, was the dovetailing of the commonplace habits of our social order with the first beginnings of the series of events to topple that social order headlong. Suppose you had taken a pair of compasses on Friday night and drawn a circle with a radius of five miles around the Woking sand pits. In that case, I doubt if you had one human being outside it unless it was some relation of stent or the three or four cyclists or London people lying dead on the common whose emotions or habits were at all affected by the newcomers. Many people had heard of the cylinder and talked about it at leisure, but it certainly did not make the sensation that a request to Germany would have done. That night, Paul Henderson's telegram describing the gradual unscrewing of the shot was judged to be a rumor in London. His evening paper, after wiring for authentication from him and receiving no reply, the man was killed, decided not to print a special edition. Even within the five-mile circle, the great majority of people were inert. I have already described the behavior of the men and women I spoke to. All over the district, people were dining and supping, working men were gardening after the day's labors, children were being put to bed, young people were wandering through the lanes lovemaking, and students sat over their books. Maybe there was a murmur in the village streets, a novel and dominant topic in the public houses, and here and there, a messenger, or even an eyewitness of the later occurrences, caused a whirl of excitement, a shouting, and a running to and fro. Still, for the most part, the daily routine of working, eating, drinking, and sleeping went on as it had done for countless years, as though no planet Mars existed in the sky, even at Woking Station and Horsell and Chobham, that was the case. In Woking Junction, until a late hour, trains were stopping and going on, others were shunting on the sidings, passengers were alighting and waiting, and everything was proceeding most ordinarily. A boy from the town, trenching on Smith's Monopoly, was selling papers with the afternoon's news. The ringing impact of trucks and the sharp whistle of the engines from the junction mingled with their shouts of men from Mars. Excited men came into the station about nine o'clock with great tidings and caused no more disturbance than drunkards might have. People rattling London wards peered into the darkness outside the carriage windows and saw only a rare, flickering, vanishing spark dance up from the direction of Horsell a red glow and a thin veil of smoke driving across the stars, and thought that nothing more serious than a heath fire was happening. It was only around the edge of the common that any disturbance was perceptible. Half a dozen villas were burning on the working border. There were lights in all the houses on the common side of the three villages, and the people there kept awake till dawn. A curious crowd lingered restlessly, people coming and going but the group remaining on the Chobham and Horsell bridges. It was afterward found that one or two adventurous souls went into the darkness and crawled quite near the Martians, but they never returned, for now, and again, a light ray, like the beam of a warship searchlight, swept the common, and the heat ray was ready to follow. Save for such, that big area joint was silent and lonely, and the charred bodies lay on it all night under the stars and all the next day. Many people heard a noise of hammering from the pit. So you have the state of things on Friday night. This cylinder was in the center, sticking into the skin of our old planet Earth like a poison dart. But the poison was scarcely working yet. Around it was a patch of silent ordinary, smoking in places and a few dark, dimly seen objects lying in contorted attitudes here and there. Here and there was a burning bush or tree. Beyond was a fringe of excitement, farther than that, the inflammation had not crept as yet. In the rest of the world, the stream of life still flowed as it had for immemorial years. The fever of war that would clog veins and arteries, deaden nerves and destroy the brain had still to develop. All night long, the Martians were hammering and stirring, sleepless, indefatigable, at work upon the machines they were making ready, 
and ever and again, a puff of greenish-white smoke whirled up to the starlit sky. At about 11, a company of soldiers came through Horsell and deployed along the edge of the common to form a cordon. Later a second company marched through Chobham to deploy on the north side of the common. Several officers from the Inkerman barracks had been on the common earlier in the day, and one, Major Eden, was reported to be missing. At midnight, the regiment's colonel came to the Chobham Bridge and questioned the crowd. The military authorities were indeed alive to the seriousness of the business. About 11, the next morning's papers were able to say, a squadron of hussars, two maxims, and about 400 men of the Cardigan Regiment started from Aldershot. A few seconds after midnight, the crowd in Chertsey Road, Woking, saw a star fall from heaven into the pine woods to the northwest. It had a greenish color and caused a silent brightness like summer lightning. This was the second cylinder. That is the end of chapter 8. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next one.